Good morning, church. We're glad that you joined us here at First United Methodist Church to worship. If you uh, have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we invite you to do so so that you might receive notifications about our worship service as well as other postings that we offer. Again, we are on Facebook and hope that you will like that page as well so that you can keep informed as to the ministries and the mission that we continue to offer, although restricted and uh, virtual by most part, but uh, available to all as we seek to live out the call of Jesus Christ in our lives and in this church. I wanna share with you a couple of things, uh, announcements that, uh, that I think you will be interested in and we hope will keep you informed. Our relaunch team met on Monday evening to discuss the possibility of gathering again uh, for in-person worship. At that point in time, we had received notice uh, from the state about the uh, continued increase in COVID-19 positive cases. And it was the decision, the consensus of the group to be patient in our moving forward. To that end, I share with you that the team will be meeting sometime in August to assess the situation at that time and make a decision about upcoming weeks. So for the now, for, for the time being, uh, we will continue to offer worship virtually. I also share with you that it was in that meeting that there was a discussion about the possibility of connecting you to connect with Candy and me, and of course us to connect uh, with you. We have uh, we've initiated a plan where we are going to gather in small neighborhood groups and spend some time together in discussion and sharing uh, a little bit of ourselves as well as our hopes and dreams for First Church. We hope that as you receive a, an invitation to that opportunity that you will, uh, that you will seriously uh, consider being a part of those uh, gatherings. Finally, I want to share with you that the church office is moving electronic. Uh, we are trying to uh, to streamline the way and the method that we communicate with you and we have in this most recent mailing sent and included enclosed a connect card and this card is an opportunity for you to inform us as to the method and the means for which we might be able to communicate to you electronically albeit email or text message through uh, your cell phone. Again, we invite you to, to uh, communicate with us uh, through that connection card or even possibly sending us an email at cfumc at citynet.net. That might be the quickest and easiest way for us to receive your email. We can update our information at that point. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is indeed good. These are definitely trying times, scary times, times where uh, we're not quite sure how to move, what to do, and for that matter, who to do it with, uh, to be quite honest. As the number of positive cases continue to rise, our anxiety rises with it. And so I ask the question, where is our hope? Where is our hope? The question could be asked in any number of situations or times. can be asked as a church tries to find their purpose and meaning. Where is our hope? Be asked of each of us as we face difficult times in our lives. Where is our hope? My prayer is, is that as we worship this morning and as we explore the scripture from Romans, Paul's letter to the church there in anticipation of his visit, that we might find words of comfort, words of assurance, but most of all, hope. Hope that God has not given up on us. Hope that God is indeed redeeming the world and redeeming us. And as we worship this day, 
May our hearts be open. May our minds and our spirits be in tune to God as He continues the redeeming process in our own lives. this call to worship Psalm 66 verses 1 through 4 shout for joy to God all the earth sing the glory of his name give to him glorious praise say to God how awesome are your deeds so great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you and sing praises to you they sing praises to your name. Our opening hymn this morning is found on page 388 in the Methodist hymnal, if you're following along. But we're singing it to a different tune this morning. We're using the tune that's commonly associated with Breathe On Me, Breath of God.
Last week, we invited you to share with us your joys or concerns so that we might be in prayer for one another. I invite you again to call the church office this week to afford us an opportunity to offer uh, to God our prayers for you, to celebrate those praises and to offer our hearts in prayer for your concerns. At this time, I invite you to join me for prayer. A loving God, sometimes we're not quite sure how to move forward. Life is precarious. It, it ebbs and flows, and sometimes we feel out of control. And in our inability to sense <laughs> control of what's going on in our lives, we find ourselves in a downward spiral. Not sure how to make it up out of our own pits, but you, O oh God, invite us to cry out to you, to cry out to you for help. And indeed, you are our strength. And you give us courage and through you we find ourselves as we trust you in our whole lives outside that pit and on a journey in life that leads to abundance forgive us oh god forgive us when we when we fail to see the possibilities that you place around us. Forgive us, O oh God, when we fail to do the things you call us to do. Forgive us, O oh God, when we do things that we know we ought not do. And forgive us, O oh God, for not having our complete trust in you and holding on to you for hope. Oh God, you continually redeem us day in and day out. We find ourselves anew. We pray that your spirit upon us will continue to move, that we might grow in our life to you and toward those around us. And in the end, find abundance. Lord, we lift up those concerns that have been shared this week, and we pray, we pray, O oh God, that you will offer all those who have need your healing and guiding hand, strength where strength is needed, and grace upon grace, that they may know and feel your presence day in and day out. And I pray, O oh God, that as we continue to give ourselves in worship this day, that again we might make you our focus. And having done so, may we grow in our discipleship, in our life of faith with one another. Lead us, O oh God, as we give ourselves to you. For we pray this in the name of Christ who taught us to pray as we pr pray together now. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the word of God found in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, but if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will now be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have, who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of God for the people of God this special day. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Harry. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, I pray that you will open our minds and hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray, oh God, that in this moment you will speak to us. And that in your speaking we may hear the voice of truth. I pray right now, O oh God, that you will use me as your instrument, that you will use me in spite of who I am. And Lord, I ask that you place me behind the cross, behind your cross, so that your glory and your light might shine above all that is said and done this day. For we pray this in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. One of the things that I'm constantly reminded of by Candy is that I'm human. Now, she doesn't say that in a negative way. She says that in a way that's affirming, actually, in reminding me that it's okay to be human. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to be who you are. You know, that cultural mindset that we often embrace called what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. <laughs> it's interesting that uh, just the other day I was having a conversation with our new neighbor on Mandan Road and um, one of the expressions that I said in the midst of that conversation is well what you see is what you get and, and I'm not quite sure he knew how to take that, knowing that I was a pastor, knowing uh, that I was a part of First United Methodist Church. Um, I, I don't know what to make of that, but maybe later on the, the, the story will continue and we'll have some sense and idea about what he thought about that statement. What you see is what you get. I am human. Hmm. Now I'm not saying that that expression is a bad expression, or it's necessarily wrong, but, uh, but sometimes we embrace that in such a way that, um, that is more of an escapism of who we are. 
and honesty and authenticity, really. It, it's, um, it's also seen, this expression, as an extreme sense of realism. It, it's uh, a commonsensical approach to life. What you see is what you get. It's a vaccine against disappointment, you might even say. It ensures us that our expectations are not too unrealistic. What you see is what you get. I believe that to some degree, but there was a book written not too long ago by the, uh, an author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell entitled Blink. And in this book, he proposes this idea that not everything is as it seems. In, in fact, he, he says uh, pretty clearly that things are never as they seem to some degree. You see, in this book, Gladwell uh, asserts that there are times when empirical evidence does not always guarantee the truth of what's being seen. He uses an example of a statue that they carbon dated and thought that by all uh, research that it was an authentic piece dating centuries ago. But in reality, it was nothing more than a fraud. Gladwell asserts that sometimes we have to rely on our gut feeling when we see something or experience something in our lives that just doesn't seem right, that usually our gut will tell us where the truth lies. So in other words, Malcolm Gladwell made me rethink this notion that what you see is what you get into thinking that things are not always as they seem not always as they appear. Some years ago, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote these words, every roof is agreeable to the eye until it is lifted. Every roof is agreeable to the eye until it is lifted. Hmm. And then we find tragedy. Moaning women and hard eyed husbands. In other words, things may look great on the outside, but on the inside there's turmoil, there's tragedy, there's struggle. Huh. It's a lot about it's a lot about what life is like, isn't it? Oh, we know that all too well, really. We meet people on the street, we know people in our neighborhoods, we have friends and acquaintances who walk through life with masks on. And to be quite honest, sometimes we're the ones wearing the masks. You know, people who seem joyful, always smiling, seem to have it all together. Life, that is. Everything, well, every duck in a row, you might say. Hmm. Well, I will tell you that I don't have ducks. I've got squirrels and they're everywhere. <laughs> People who seem to have it together, but on the inside are struggling to keep it together. Struggling with the pain of loneliness and despair. The circumstances that hold them bondage physically, spiritually, emotionally. They find themselves hopeless. Hopeless. Some would say that these people live pretentious lives. It's all pretend. And, and if we were really honest with ourselves, we could, see, we could say even that part of our lives are pretentious, that we struggle at times to be real, an authentic, honest, maskless. And truth be told, it's in that struggle 
that we find ourselves slipping into a state of despair. We've seen people around us despondent, lonely, especially during these times when there's a lack of social interaction. People who find themselves in this miry pit, a miry pit of despair. It's a slippery slope. And sometimes we fall and find ourselves deeper and deeper into that pit. The pit of self-pity or even defeatism. So we cry out. As the psalmist said in Psalm 40, we cry out. We cry out to God for help. And as we struggle in our hearts, it, in our life, our hearts grow inwardly. They groan inwardly as we search for purpose and meaning, healing, wholeness, even redemption. We need something to hold on to. Something, something that will give us hope. When I served Wesley United Methodist Church in Morgantown, the, uh, the head custodian took me outside one day and said, I want to show you something. And I, um, I wasn't hesitant at all. I thought he was going to show me an issue with the building or uh, maybe the landscape that I needed to address. So I was prepared, you might say, for the worst. <laughs> And so Junior took me outside and um, he took me onto Willie Street. And Willie Street is right in front of the building. And he said, uh, as he pointed to a, a text that had been uh, scripted onto the side of the building, he asked me to read the text. And so. The text, as I read it, um, was in two columns. And the first word at the top left read Christ. Then uh, the second column at the top said, um, is our, the, the text under Christ on the left said only, and the last word in the fourth quadrant was the word hope. He said, read that for me. And so I read it. Christ is our only hope. And he said, you're wrong. Read it again. And I looked at the side of the building and I said, well, Junior, it says Christ is our only hope. And he said, you're reading it wrong. And I said, well, how do you read it? And he said, it should be read, Christ only is our hope. Christ only is our hope. Wow. I said, that, that's a big difference. When we say Christ is our only hope, it's almost as if saying that Christ is our last resort. We say it with exasperation. We say it as a prayer, a cry for help, you might say. Christ being our only hope. But when we say Christ only is our hope, we place Christ above all hopes and dreams. That, my friends, is the difference. And that is the message that Paul wanted to get across to the people, to the people at the church in Rome. He wanted them to have hearts filled with hope. Hope. Viktor Frankl is a, a neurological psychologist, and he, he wrote a book years ago uh, entitled Man's Search for Meaning, the classic tribute to hope from the Holocaust. Auschwitz, 
He was a part of the concentration camp there. Uh, Frankel is most notably as the most uh, magnificent and remarkable psychologist in his field since Freud. He gained that notoriety and that honor in this and through this work. He set out in the midst of that, uh, that experience in that concentration camp exploring the psyche of those people who had survived. And what he found was is the people who survived, the people who not just survived but actually thrived in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the horror, were people who had purpose and meaning. People who were hopeful that God had given them a purpose and meaning even in the midst of their suffering. I'll be quite honest with you in saying that comparatively my suffering is nowhere near that of those who experience that atrocity in their own lives. And sometimes my hope wavers and sometimes I ask myself, what is the point? Where is my purpose? Do I really have meaning in life? And, and maybe you're asking yourself some of the same questions or have, even in this time. Purpose and meaning give us hope for a future. Paul's letter to the church at Rome was written to a relatively new church that was trying to find their way. In fact, they were trying to establish their own identity. And the letter was filled with deep theological truths. Oh, it is so deep, so deep. But it was also filled with encouraging words that spoke of a hope that could only be found in God. In fact, Paul stated plainly that what the church saw at that time was not what things would always be. As children of God, the church in Rome would benefit from God's promises that would lead to something that they had yet to see. Not just the eternal redemption and their reward, but also an abundant life in the present time. Paul's words to the church was for them to hold fast to hope in the midst of their own trouble, confusion, difficulties, struggle, even suffering. And wait patiently. To hold on to hope and to wait patiently for a glory about to be revealed to them. There's a singer-songwriter by the name of Stephen Curtis Chapman who wrote a song uh, some years ago called Glorious Unfolding. It's a special song for me and Candy because it was a song that uh, reminded us of God's presence and how God will continue to unfold uh, in our lives something glorious. The song is, uh, is set to a video of a young lady who has lost her father recently. And she returns to his hometown uh, in search of something that would, something tangible that, that she could hold on to that would give her hope in the midst of her sorrow. And as the video unfolds, as the story, you might say, unfolds, uh, she finds clues that lead to other clues that lead to a final letter that her father had written specifically to her. It was like a treasure hunt, you might say. A treasure hunt to experience the goodness of God even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of suffering, 
and struggle. You see, we need to have that same yearning, that same desire to experience the glory of God that's revealed all around us. And as a church, I think that, that we're struggling even now as a denomination and, and, and as a, a mainline denomination to find our way, to find our own identity, our new purpose and new calling. We're seeking ways to, to be relevant in the community and in the world. And in some ways, we are relevant and connecting with the world. But I think God is calling the church to more. I think God is always calling the church to be more dynamic, more relevant, more of an unstoppable force in a community and in the world. An instrument of change that brings about the goodness of God in the lives of people that reveals God's glory to the world. Hmm. And it's a call. This, this letter of Paul's is a call for us to find that which God is doing in the midst and, and it requires us to acknowledge this uh, the state of being that I call a liminal state. A liminal state of life. A liminal state is sort of like limbo. You're, we're in this in-between time. We're not where we were, but we're not where we need to be either. And there's this tension that exists between the two and an opportunity for us to go back to where we were or to move forward to that which God has placed before us, that God is revealing to us. And it is there and in that forward leaning that we find hope. Not that we forget or um, ignore our past or even our present, but using those tools and using those experiences to help us lean forward into the hope of Christ so that God's glory might be revealed. All, all with courage and perseverance and most, mostly patience. Patience in not being satisfied with the present, but leaning toward the future promised to us by God. And we hold on to hope with all our might. And God will begin to re reveal God's glory all around us. So today, today, a heart full of hope is all we have. And it fuels our imagination in ways about how things ought to be. And it's the hope for things that's not yet, but still promised to us. And God calls us to be faithful. To be faithful to follow His lead as we move and lean forward into the future. Our responsibility as we scatter the seeds of love around us is to be faithful. To do the work of God in the world. And it is this hope that we have that empowers us to confront our current situation. To inspire us to work in the present for the things that God is calling us to embrace. With hearts full of hope, we desire for others to know and experience redemption in their lives. The redemption, the same redemption that we've experienced. And we, we know the power <coughs> of life over death. We know the freedom from bondage. We know how to love and receive love. And we hunger for more and more of it. And we hunger especially for those who need it in their lives. And we recognize that God is calling us to be that agent of hope. 
So, we, the people called First United Methodist Church, lean forward. We lean forward and we wait patiently for God to continue to reveal to us His promises and to fulfill His promises to bring about redemption in this world, freedom in this world, love in this world, and life abundant in this world. Friends, Christ only is our hope. May we be that hopeful people in this time, knowing that God is in the process of redeeming the world and that Jesus is calling us to join Him in the redemption process. Amen and amen. As we come to a time of offering, we encourage you to continue sending your tithes and your gifts to the church. Uh, the mailing address is listed on your bulletin that you've received. Um, knowing that those gifts are still useful and still um, of, of help to those in need during this time, even though we are separated by distance. We ask that you give gener generously during this time of offering.
us pray. O oh, gracious God, bless our offering that it may reach and touch those who hunger, those who hurt, and those who seek new hope. As part of the global village, we care about all of our sisters and brothers. We pray for world peace, for liberty to those oppressed, for joy to those who are weary, in honor of our sovereign God. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is found in the Methodist hymnal on page 178. An interesting side note about this piece, the hymn tune itself was written by V. Earl Copes, who actually performed in this sanctuary, gave an organ recital in, in April of 1969. Um, this is an interesting tune, not one we sing often. Um, Hope of the World, 178 in the Methodist hymnal. church to communicate that message of hope needed by all people everywhere 
May we as hopeful people share the good news of God's grace and mercy with all we meet on our journey so that they too may have hope. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.